everyone. Good evening. My name is Colton Harris, and I'm a program manager at the Connecticut Office of the Arts, and I would like to welcome you to The Talking Artist. The Talking Artist was conceived during a time when we felt as though artists, creatives of all types, needed a space to convene, to talk, to be inspired. We've been in the midst of some of the greatest chaos that we've ever experienced in history, and we know that art really heals, it brings together, and it builds community. And so the talking artist was really the brainchild of the brokenness. And in that brokenness, we wanted to come together to give platform to different voices and spaces to talk about pressing issues, creative content, and really figuring out how we can build community together. So I'm really excited about our conversation that we're going to have today. As we think about mental health and wellness, in our society, in our world, we know that oftentimes artists and creatives of all kinds and all human beings are sometimes marginalized and sometimes dismissed. And though our art is healing, we still struggle oftentimes in the darkness. And so this month we wanted to have some more specific conversation around our minds, our wellness, and what kind of work we can do to really bring cultural and community healing. So I'm going to introduce our guest, and we're really excited. This, this guest is special to me. I won't tell you why yet, um, but I know that tonight is going to really be impactful to all of us, and we're all going to have something to take away as we move forward. And we also want to, as we get into this, give a thank you to our partner in this, the Cultural Coalition. They have been really instrumental in helping us create space for the talking artists and to bring guests together to talk about these issues. So Marlene Johnson, an artist, art therapist, spoken word poet, and activist, Marlene grounds her work in the goal of making the invisible visible. In her art therapy, she creates spaces that foster community dialogue on racial and gender inequality. Art allows people to share as much or as little as we want with the world, she says. It gives you a voice and it gives you a choice again, because oftentimes your choices are taken from you. Marlene is an alumna of Connecticut College and earned a Master of Arts degree in art therapy from the School of the Art Institute of Chicago. She interned for several years with A Long Walk Home, a nonprofit devoted to using the performing arts to end violence against girls and women. And she now works as a trainer at Posse, the most renowned college access and youth leadership program in the country. As a 2017 Art Institute artist in residence in Howman Square, she guided citizens of North Lawndale in creating a communal mosaic mural, exploring their experiences of race and class on Chicago's west side. Marlene draws on insights from art therapy and the work she does with young people in our, in, in our programs for youth at risk. I'd like to welcome to the stage, all the way from Chicago, Marlene Johnson. So, Marley, let's get into this and dig a little bit deeper into you know, some of the things you talked about um, in your presentation just now. Um, I would love to talk about um, your, your thesis project that you worked on and dig into that a little bit more. Um, I found this concept of this, um, using poetry as the emotional container and mosaics as the physical container, really interesting. Um, so I wonder if you could just elaborate a little bit more on, on that. Yeah, um, that's a really great question. I think when I set out to do the work of my master's thesis, one, it was really to acknowledge the fact that like, I was a survivor working alongside survivors, um, and there was secondary trauma that I was experiencing as I was doing that work. Um, and in order to be able to you know, clinically care for the girls in the way that they needed. I needed to be caring for myself and I needed to be doing work. And then I was also really interested in thinking about like how we experience trauma and trauma in the body. Um, and writing at that point just didn't seem like enough. Like I needed something tangible. Yeah. I needed something that I could actually like, the materials needed to be tactile yeah. in a way that just pen to paper um, was not. And so 
when I, I'm a self-taught mosaic artist, when I was first introduced to mosaics, it kind of just clicked and I really loved the idea of being able to put pieces um, and to create wholeness. And then I, you know, really translated that to my own story of like healing and survivorship. Like what are the pieces that I'm gonna take? What are right, the learnings right. that I'm gonna take? And what are the things that I'm gonna leave behind? Yeah. Um, did you experiment with any other um, sort of physical art forms before you got to mosaics? No. <laughs> um, once I know, I know. And I kind of was off to the races. Um, and I used stained glass. I used tile. I used uh, found objects. I used mirror. I love using mirror a lot. I love to be able to see myself reflected um, in my art. That was something that was really important. And for other people to see themselves reflected in the art as well. Uh, so what, um, I guess, advice would you give to folks who may not be artists or not consider themselves artists, how do they then approach this concept of using art for therapy? And I guess, I guess backing up a little bit would be, what is your, your approach to the discipline and, and how do you navigate that with potential clients or just community members or, or people that you want to engage with this concept as art therapy? I think it's still a very um, like new concept for a lot of people. Um, where they may not understand the intersections between art and therapy as an actual practice and discipline? That's also a really great question. <laughs> um, I think one of the things I love specifically about mosaics is that shapes. Um, right. and, and that's something that we learn in elementary school, we learn shapes. Um, and and in, I also, growing up, really loved puzzles, I and so I, yeah. the first thing I thought it was I'm like, definitely like bringing you, it back to just puzzles. Yes, right. yes, I loved puzzles, and so I think for me, that is always the place that I start. Oftentimes, I hear a lot of people say, I, I can't draw, um, mm -hmm. or I can't paint, um, and I think one of the things I loved about A Long Walk Home was they were really good about asking the young people, what, what do you do right in your daily life? What are the things that you're already doing? And how is that art? And how do okay. we elevate that to fine art? And so I think my approach would to, when working with people is to ask them what they already do. Um, because we don't need to reinvent the wheel here. Right. Um, and then when it comes to mosaics, you know, I, I approach it as a puzzle. And I ask people to think about shapes rather than like a person or an image, um, because I feel like that is a little bit more mm -hmm. inviting than saying we're going to do a portrait. Um, we're going to just play with shapes. Wonderful. Thank you. Um, and so as we're talking about working with people and working with communities, um, Again, I really liked this, this idea of recreating a narrative um, with mosaics and specifically in terms of working with communities and working with neighborhoods. Can you just touch on that a little bit more? Um, and then I would love to dive into how um, communities can use this as a practice. Yes, um, I think a lot about the work that I was doing in Chicago, specifically on the west side of Chicago for extent, and then on the south side of Chicago, um, and those were neighborhoods that, in a lot of ways, if you're from Chicago, the west and the south side, there's beef, like, they're like, <laughs> we are very different, um, but as someone who was on the outside, I grew up on the north side, I was able to see a lot of the similarities, um, the disinvestment in neighborhoods, the lack of resources, um, the over-policing, and so I, you know, and the narratives that were placed on these neighborhoods, right, like, you can't go there, they're extremely dangerous, um, but you go into these communities, and they're thriving, and they're joyful, and they're you know, they just need a little bit more help. And so I think part of that was thinking about, like, how do you see your community? Um, and how do you want other people to see your community? Um, and how can we bring those and elicit those stories to the forefront is where we begin. And allowing them and, and honoring that they're the expert of their lived experience, right. of their neighborhood, of their communities, um, and leaning on them to tell us what they need versus going in and, and assuming that I know yes, because I absolutely. don't. absolutely. Yeah. yeah. Um, yeah, and going, going into that, um, something you also said that really resonated with me was um, culturally responsive art. Um, so I want, I want to dig into that one a, a lot, um, as well as healing can be joyful, right? Um, and so what made me think about this was specifically, Erica, you know what I'm talking about, um, was specifically a moment um, after a protest that was held here in London 
and um, there were uh, people that were protesting, mostly women, that were that started dancing, that started twerking, you know, and expressing joy, right? And there were members within the same group, mostly men, that were kind of like, well, what are you guys doing? That's disrespectful, that's inappropriate. Um, you know, and my friend was like, no, this is how we're expressing our joy. And our joy in itself is, is, um, is protest, right? It is revolution to be black and to be joyful. Mm -hmm. um, and so I just want to talk about that a little bit, about one, the, 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 how joy can be healing, as well as art that is culturally responsive. All of the heavy hitters. Uh, yeah, I wasn't able to get these in advance, so we're off the dome. Um, I think one of the things that I'm always really intrigued by is the idea that people don't own their expertise um, and the things that they're really good at um, and the things that they've been doing for a long time and have poured time and energy and investment into. And when I was working at a long walk home, that was something that they very much wanted to uplift in the young people is, no, you're really good at this um, and you do it well. And, you know, I actually had a lot of imposter syndrome when I went to the mm -hmm. School of the Art Institute of Chicago because I, you know, took art classes at Connecticut College and, you know, I took painting, I took drawing, I took sculpting, but none of those things actually ever felt like me. I just took them because they were prerequisites um, to go to the Art Institute. And my art form was writing, it was poetry. And so oftentimes when we would have to do response art or do projects, I always felt like an imposter because immediately I wanted to write. Mm -hmm. But I was at a world-renowned art school um, and that wasn't what was in some way socially acceptable there. And so I felt like an outsider at times until I found mentors, until I found professors that were like, if this is who you are, then be who you are. Um, and that was really important to me. And so instead of trying to take young people and force them to learn art practices that are unfamiliar, unfamiliar to them, really uplifting what they already do. Yeah. Um, and, and I think one of the things that we are constantly pushing against is like what is considered fine art, yes. right? Yep. Um, and so to you know, have young people who say I'm a hair braider or I'm a nail artist or I'm a dancer, but I haven't taken formal dance classes, like let's, let's rewrite this, right? Who are you? What are you good at? And let, let's start there. Um, and in terms of healing can be joyful, I think oftentimes, you know, people hear the idea of healing and it's daunting. Yeah. Um, <laughs> it's daunting. Um, and I'm someone who believes that we're always healing. Um, I, you know, healing is lifelong. Yeah. Um, I don't believe that you, you heal from a thing and then it's over with. Like you are, you know, nurturing those wounds for forever. Um, and it does, and there are seasons, right, where healing is hard, but there are also seasons where you're shedding and you are becoming and, and simultaneously becoming undone and you find community and you find reverence in this idea of letting go. Um, and I think that's really beautiful. Uh, yeah. Wonderful. Um, are there any specific, and if you have to take a minute to think about this, please, because I did not prep her. Um, <laughs> are there any um, specific um, like public art projects, um, social movements that you know heavily focus in, in arts that have been, um, in your opinion, culture responsive that you sort of resonate with or that you admire? Is there anything that comes to mind um, specifically that you've seen that was like that was that's done well in terms of using art for social change, using art that's culturally responsive? Um, I think one of the things that I think about a lot is like how do we uplift the local artists, right, and the community artists who are doing work. Yes. So a lot of the times um, the ones that I, I see doing that the best are, you know, like local local artists. And so I think about some of the people that I've worked with. Um, I think about um, artists in Chicago. They were, they created an altar, right? Like thinking about mm. missing and murdered women. Um, and that was their art form was to create altars and to raise awareness around what was happening because we know that it's happening all over the country. We know that it's happening all over the world and yet we're not talking about it. And this idea, but on the altar, right? It wasn't just like pictures, it was toys. Um, it was 
uh, it was letters, it was images, it was flowers, it was fruit. And I thought that that was really beautiful to really think about like, one, like what is an altar and how do we reclaim altars, but also mm -hmm. um, how there's an honoring that happens when you, when you do that. Um, I mean, I have a lot of artists that I love, who? Um, like Bisa Butler is one of my favorite okay, artists. Yes, that's one of mine as well. Oh, she's amazing. <laughs> um, I got to see her at a conference uh, a ah. couple of months ago. And I, you know, again, she talked a lot about in imposter syndrome too. And, and I think that that's something that we just don't talk about enough. Yeah. Um, and the idea of representation in art, which I think is really important. Wonderful. Thank you so much. And I'm glad that you were able to, to roll with that one because I know that was a lot there. Um, so as we continue talking about sort of social change, um, and this can be at, and when we talk about social change, I think that word can seem really overwhelming and daunting in itself, but this can be something from the micro level, right, up to the macro. How can people individually use their art, do you think, in even everyday practice to, to make some kind of social impact, whether it's in their neighborhoods or in their communities or, or on a larger scale? Yeah. Um, yeah, social change is one of those things or organizing, it, it feels very big, but in a lot of ways we, we do those things right. every single day. Like yep. we, we organize people to come here to a talk. Um, I have seen it look a lot of different things. I've seen it in the physical, I've seen it in the digital world. I think mm -hmm. we've seen a lot of things that have happened in the digital world within the last two years, um, especially with the pandemic. Um, I have seen, you know, people use testimony and writing um, to change policy. Mm -hmm. um, so I think, like, how does the individual then in, in, impact, right, larger ecosystems? Um, I have seen, you know, in a lot of the images that I showed you, there were protest posters. So, you know, young people, like, drawing and using that as a means to raise awareness as well. Um, I've, you know, Nina Simone is one of my favorite artists, and Mississippi Goddamn, that is a protest song, right? <laughs> like, that is a cry for a change that has to happen in the world. And so I think, you know, there are so many different ways that art can be used as a form of social change, and that has been, it already has been done. Yeah. Um, so where are you at now with your personal art, pro um, art practice? Um, is there anything new that you're exploring or anywhere you're thinking of where you want to go with your own personal, personal art? That's a great question. <laughs> um, candidly, I um, experienced a great loss in 2015, um, and my mother passed away, and I stopped writing. Mm. And this past... February was the first time I wrote in six years, wrote a poem. Uh, and so I'm really excited to actually explore and pick back up writing um, because it is something that is extremely important to me. Um, so that's the first part. Um, but for the last couple of years, I think I've really been diving into my mosaic identity um, mm -hmm. and working with a local Chicago artist, a muralist who has been doing mosaics for 20 plus years. Um, and so she's kind of been teaching me her practice, her community-based mosaic practice, because again, the, the community mural that I did, I was self-taught. So <laughs> <laughs> there was a lot that I learned on the back end that I was like, oh, this would have made this project so much easier. But you don't know what you don't know. So I'm great. Her name is Carolyn Elaine. So I'm really grateful to Carolyn um, for taking me under her wing and and for being very generous because I think that that's also something that is not doesn't always happen within the art world. Like yeah. people are like, this is mine, and I don't want you to replicate it, and I don't want you to have it. And Carolyn was like, I will teach you mm. everything that I know. Um, but at the end of the day, you can never be me. And it wasn't in a way that was like, she was bragging, but she was like, you are gonna bring who you are, you are gonna bring right. your lived experiences, you are gonna bring your techniques to this practice so I can teach you everything that I know, and you will make it your own. Um, and so that is something that I, you know, really love and also want to replicate is this idea of teaching people and sharing um, versus kind of hoarding and keeping the things like, we are all artists, we are all makers, um, and you will bring who you are to it, so like, why not share? I love that. Um, and to go off of that, do you have any advice for folks um, who may be self-taught artists and um, may be feeling that imposter syndrome, um, any words or wisdom that you wanna share um, to those folks as well as 
um, any advice that you may have for people seeking community or seeking mentorship within the arts, like that, that process in road, um, if you have any words of wisdom that you want to share on that. Yes. Um, the first is always check your draft email um, <laughs> folder <laughs> because when I was doing, when I set out to do my community mural, I actually sent Carolyn an email and it was a beautifully written email asking mm -hmm. for mentorship and support. And, you know, in my mind, I thought I sent it and I was cleaning out my email years later and I realized that I actually never sent it. <laughs> um, so there's that, like if you're gonna send something, actually make sure that you send it. Um, but I also think the timing of things is always really important because when I did actually send the email and you know, within a week's time we, we met, she was thinking about you know, leaving mosaics behind. And, mm. and so then she was like, hey, this is a moment for me to actually pass on what I know. Wow, that's beautiful. Um, and be able to, you know, carry on the legacy of this art form. So that, you know, is something that's really important. And then I think about a lot of the opportunities that I've been afforded to answer your question. I didn't talk about this earlier, but I've been doing work with another organization called the Voices and Faces Project. Um, they do writing workshops for survivors of gender-based violence and really the idea of like putting a voice and a face to, to survivorship and facilitating writing workshops for young people throughout the city of Chicago in the juvenile detention center and schools on the south and west side. And I think that that's really important, um, but I, got involved with that program because I took a writing workshop okay. and they were looking to expand. It was for adults and they were looking to expand to adolescents. And then they, you know, saw that that was the, the space that I had been working in and tapped me. And I've now been working with them for several, for seven years. Mm -hmm. So thinking about, you know, the opportunities, um, asking questions, sending emails, Send um, <laughs> Super important, um, but a lot of the opportunities I've been afforded is because I just was like, I'm gonna push past, right? I'm gonna push past this imposter syndrome. Yep. I'm gonna, I'm gonna bet on myself, uh, and I'm gonna so. go for it. And then I've just been so um, amazed at the opportunities that have came out of that. So go to the conference, actually talk to people when you go to the conference. <laughs> um, you know, send the email. Uh, yeah, take the workshop. Um, and I'm sorry, I, I missed her name, um, but your mentor. When you had sent that email, had you already met her before or? No. Okay, yeah, so I wanted, I wanted to get to that because um, I, I think that there is this, and of course it's always, it's, it's fearful and daunting to be able to, to put yourself out there and, um, and that's something that I personally have experience with in terms of creating your own path or narrative, right? That doesn't always have to be, if something isn't established, this established internship or established, you know, thing, so don't be afraid to ask for people mm -hmm. for help. Mm -hmm. um, I've actually found that people tend to be um, more willing than I think we give uh, folks credit for. Um, and I think especially in terms of sharing, sharing knowledge, I think there's a lot of folks that like want to share their knowledge mm -hmm. um, and creating those op own opportunities for yourself. So yeah, I'm glad that you, that you mentioned that, that you just sent that email out eventually yeah, yeah, when they get yeah. out the draft <laughs> box, but that's amazing. <laughs> Oh, and then the other thing I was thinking about too um, was there were a couple people that I did reach out to that I didn't get emails from, but right. just in doing Google searches, I was able to pull their CVs or their resumes up and it was two mosaic artists and I just looked at the similarities and there was, they had learned and taught at different places all over the world, but they had one thing in common and it was a course in Italy. And mm -hmm. I was like, there's something here. Right. Um, so then part of what I did with um, my residency was I actually took a, a professional development class in Italy. Um, so I went to the same course that they both took there. So, you know, I didn't talk to them directly, but I was able to use right their resumes, their CVs to see where their learning was and then apply that to my own as well. That is a golden nugget right there, y'all. Research, doing that research um, in, into folks. So I'm glad you shared that as well. Um, I want to give time um, for folks in our audience to um, ask questions. And so I think we may need a camera break for a moment. Um, so if you guys have questions, I know sometimes it can be scary to ask. So we're going to give you a few minutes. Think about it. I know there's some things going on in those noggins. Um, and then we're going to have um, a short Q&A. Um, and if you don't know, we're actually also going to open up the mic afterwards for folks who want to share any art, share any words, share any poetry. So again, think about that as well um, if you want to get up. 
um, afterwards. And if not, we will have our DJ just play music again. Um, so again, we can all just talk and be in community with each other. So we'll be right back in a moment. Um, so if we have any folks that want to get up um, and have a question for Marley, now is the time. So I'm wondering how, well, what experiences you have with getting past a lot of the stigma around therapy? Mm. That's a great one. Um, that's a really great question. So getting around the stigma of therapy, um, you know, I went to school for art therapy, so I believe in therapy. <laughs> like, and if you didn't know, now you know. Um, and I've also been someone who has gone to therapy since I was 15 years old, so I've and, and currently still in therapy. So half of my life I've been in therapy. Um, but I think the the stigma around therapy is one of just like of misunderstanding, right? And so when we think about like what therapy is and why we go, it's just, it's like, you know, it's to help you. It is, it's truly, truly, truly to help you. And I think one of the things that I often think about is I never want to be a burden, right? So I, I never want to be a burden to people. So I go to my therapist because I'm paying you to, you know, to release this burden and I don't have to put it on my friends or my family or the people who I know who are also going through so, so much. So I think that's one of the ways that I think about it is just like, this is my way of not necessarily burning the people that I care about, but I'm still able to talk about, you know, the things that I'm grappling with. And I think, think about therapy as, you know, we go to the doctor, we get our annuals, right. we go to the dentist, right? I think about therapy in that way. It is like a you know, I'm caring for myself just as I would care for myself in any other kind of capacity, which I think if we normalize it in that way, um, you know, there's a different entry point into the conversation as to like why you seek therapy. Um, and then also thinking about alternative um, forms of therapy, like not everybody is going to engage in talk therapy. There's dance movement therapy, there is music, there's movement therapy, dance movement therapy, art therapy, drama therapy, right? So psychotherapy, CBT, there's so many different forms. Um, so exploration is also a part of it as well. Um, exploring what is out there and really figuring out you know, what works for you. But I think about it as like I'm taking care of myself just as I would if I would go to the doctor, the dentist, the gynecologist, what have you. That was a great question, thank you for that. Do we have any more from the audience? Uh, good, evening. Oh, good evening. Thank you for your poem and telling us about your, um, your life work. Uh, my name is Conroy Warren. Uh, I was, while you were talking, um, I was thinking about um, uh, the, the power of, of imagery. What do you think about the power of imagery in, in terms of um, what, what you see? Like, um, I, as an artist, well, I'm a musician, basically. Uh, and um, I mean, in terms of uh, the work, of what, what people see on the screen, visual, visually, especially young people, and the things that they're seeing, and the power of what they're seeing, and the responsibility of the artist um, who, you know, who is um, creating those imagery. What do you think about that? What do you think? Yeah. <laughs> Um, I, well, one, I think the first thing that comes to mind is that representation matters. Um, and you, when you're talking about imagery, it's so important. And for me, you know, I wrote a poem and I, I talk about this idea of not being, not seeing myself represented in what survivors looked like until I started to work at a long walk home and how that shifted my narrative and my understanding of, of healing, right? When I saw someone who look, looked like me um, going on this journey and, and going on this process of healing. And I think that that is translated into all the other art forms, right? It's so important to see, you know, yourselves like represented, uh, you know, in media and political spaces as teachers. Um, you know, I think about when I was at the Art Institute and my very first instructor uh, for my counseling techniques class was a black woman and how I think my, sh my shoulders dropped a little bit because I was like, there's someone else who, who looks like me who's here um, and, and we might not necessarily have the same path, but there are 
there's a moment of reprieve, right? And so I think that that is really important. Representation is so important um, in all of the spaces that we're in. Um, so in music and art and politics and education in the healthcare profession um, as organizers, I think it, it, it is really, really important. Thank you. What I was getting at um, specifically is that we talk about young people, the young people, the generation coming. And when I look at certain music videos mm -hmm. and uh, and I watch, and I watch my kids or family members and friends, and and I see the image that is coming out from, especially from the black community. Um, the videos that I see, I uh, maybe I'm old school, but I'm watching all the what I call what I consider negative. They could be positive, they could be negative, but the imagery in terms of um, the gun, the guns and everything, and the um, smoke and you know the things that they're seeing, and then young people try to emulate that. And for some reason, that seems to be coming out a lot mm. into the personality and the way young people are moving around today. And in many ways, it is what they see, I think there could be other, other stories that they could be telling, mm -hmm. and they seem to be something that is condoned by the, the community where these artists are coming from. That way, what they're putting out, I think sometimes, to me, I find it's not productive in terms of the way we need to be, mm -hmm. uh, where we could be going. Uh, for instance, I'll give you an, an uh, example on the other side. I won't take much time. I'm a recording artist. Mm -hmm. And uh, I have a song called Save Humanity. Save Humanity? Save Humanity. And um, recently, someone wrote me um, the asked if I was a creator of that song. I, I said yes, and wanted if I would be on the to talk about it. But one of the reasons I'm here also is that I am, my forte is not social media. I, I wish I knew more of what, how to operate and that I can perform. Same, I don't know. <laughs> the camera and all things, that's where I need a lot of help with, the internet stuff. So, I mean, I, I hope he contact me again, but he, he told me that the reason why he's asking that is that he used, especially with these things, what happened overseas, you know, like, say he uses my song as inspiration. And I said, wow. So, you know, I said, when I, when I did the song, I said, wow, it's a good thing that I had that in mind where I'm thinking about how people listen to my, my, my work, how they've seen it, and what I want to portray. What is your mantra? Mm -hmm. um, so I'm saying, uh, yeah, okay, and I hope I can be in conversation. He's using that. Say when he wants to use it for inspiration. It's, mm -hmm. his song. it's called Save Humanity. You know? So I want to thank you, I mean, I, um, for sharing your work with us. Thank you. Yeah, could I actually respond to that yeah. if, if I'm understanding in terms of the responsibility of the artist and the art and imagery they're putting out that could um, aff affect young people. And I think that was the gist of it, if I'm yes. correct. Um, and so I, I think there's it's twofold there. I think one, um, if, if an artist is making content that is specifically uh, for young folk, then I think there is a responsibility then to be conscious of, of what they're making. But I don't think it's the responsibility, and this is my own personal opinion, for all artists um, to, I think, I think artists have the right to make adult content, I guess, I guess it's my point, right? Um, there is content that, you know, if we're talking specifically about music artists or certain songs that are just not for kids. Um, and I think that's okay. And I think that is, that is their art, right? That is how they're responding to whether it's their cultural upbringing or responding to, um, to things in their lives or to their, own, um, to their own stories, right? And I think artists have the right to tell their stories in a way that fits them. Um, and at the same time, as someone who you know, has a, a minor in human rights, I think it's wonderful when artists are socially conscious as well, right? But I think both can exist in this world. Um, and I think it's just about our response, it's our responsibility as, as adults for the young folks in our community to make sure that we're also exposing them then to the other, side. To the other things, yeah. right? And I think that's where that responsibility lies, not, necessi not necessarily on the artist, but on, on community, right? On, um, on parents. And when I say parents, I don't even necessarily mean biological, but whoever is that, um, that mentor figure in, in young folks' lives. I think that's where that responsibility lies in also having that conversation with young people, right? Because um, there are songs that I listened to when I was younger that I probably should not. But again, I had the consciousness because of conversation with, with other people to understand 
um, the difference between entertainment and reality and, and those things. So I think it's, I think it's on community um, to have that conversation to, to protect our young folks in that way. Thank you. And I, I definitely agree. And I think the other thing that I'm thinking about is censorship, right? Like there is an idea and an understanding of people being able to create what they want. And, and then the, the conversation, I think what we're getting at is like, whose responsibility is it? Like who, if you're watching, or if you're taking or consuming something, like whose responsibility is it? Like in the aftermath and how that is replicated. And I, I, for me, I think it's both and. I think it's the artist and I yeah. think it's the community, right? Like I think that one of the things that I love is this idea of being responsible for the art that you're putting out into the world, right? And the impact that it has on people. Um, but there is also a very real like understanding that people are replicating their lived experiences and their realities right. and like, and they should be able to do that. Um, and so I think what you're saying is really important. Absolutely, thank you for that question, that was wonderful. I think it's so important to share how art and therapy are so closely aligned. And I think when you're younger, we're all so often taught that art is a purely joy joyful process, when it's definitely not and has not been for, <laughs> for such an incredible time. But everyone, oh, art is a happy thing. Um, so what does bring you joy? If art is a challenging and, and it's something to overcome, it's a processing tool, what, what does bring you joy? Um, thank you. I love that question. Um, lots of things bring me joy. I have a two-year-old niece, um, and watching her kind of evolve um, and grow into the, you know, very precocious young person that she is brings me a lot of joy. Um, cooking brings me joy. Eating. I'm a, like, I feel like Chicago is <laughs> the food capital of the world. I'm just going to throw that out there. Shameless plug. So like eating and community. Like I think mm. when I joy or nourishment, I think about all of the things that bring me nourishment. So that could be, you know, consuming food that could be, you know, going to church and being in community. My spirituality is something that brings me a lot of joy. Um, my family, I, you know, I'm the middle child of five. And so I have a very large and loud family and, you know, being with them also brings me a lot of joy too. Thank you. I think that was actually the perfect question um, to end our segment. So again, thank you all so much for joining us for the second episode of The Talking Artist. Um, we will be back on June 2nd um, for our final episode of this season. Um, and then we will be back in the fall with much, much more for you all. So again, thank you so much. Um, we are still going to have the mic open and hot for y'all. So if anyone has something that they want to share, um, please come up. Otherwise, we are going to just jam out for a little bit of music. <laughs>